In the previous video, we defined what it means for a symmetric matrix to be positive semi-definite. In this video, as promised, we will use this definition to solve the problem of finding the smallest possible inner product between three unit vectors. Crucially, what we will discover along the way is a general technique for searching for positive semi-definite matrices that is called semi-definite programming. This is a technique that anyone interested in optimization should see at least once in their lifetime. And if you stay until the end of this video, I will even show you how easy it is to solve semi-definite programs with Python. So, in our quest to solve this geometry problem, we will need one additional fact about positive semi-definite matrices. We have already seen that multiplying by a positive semi-definite matrix, just like multiplying by a negative number, keeps the output in the same side as the input. Well, it turns out that positive semi-definite matrices are similar to non-negative numbers in yet another way. Non-negative numbers have the following interesting property. They are the only numbers that have a square root. This fact remains true for matrices as well. Positive semi-definite matrices are the ones that have a square root. In other words, a matrix A is positive semi-definite if and only if you can write it as C transpose times C for some other matrix C. Why the transpose, you might ask? Well, for one, without the transpose, C transpose C is not even a symmetric matrix. There is another reason that will become clear in a second. Now, let's see why this makes sense. For this implication, take a matrix that is equal to a square, multiply it by X from the left and the right, and with the slate rearrangement, we get a vector times its transpose, or in other words, the norm of the vector c times x, which is non-negative. So any square is a positive semi-definite matrix. And note that this rearrangement would not have been possible if there was no transpose here. For the other implication, I have a good and a bad news. The bad news is that this implication is a bit more complicated to prove, so we will not see a proof here. The good news is that the proof is entirely constructive and there are algorithms that take as input a positive semi-definite matrix and compute its square root. In Python, for example, you can call the function square root m for the package scipy, where the m here stands for matrix, to get a square root decomposition of a positive semi-definite matrix. Now we finally have all the necessary ingredients to solve our geometry problem. We do so in two steps. The first step is simply to reformulate the problem in terms of positive semi-definite matrices, and the second step is to actually solve this reformulation. This problem is all about inner products, so let's write them down in a matrix form. And note that the diagonals of this matrix are all equal to 1 because the vectors x, y, and z are unit vectors. Now, here is a question for you. Can you see why this matrix is positive semi-definite? If you say that this is because it has a square root, you are 100% correct. If you put the vectors x, y, and z next to each other to form a matrix, and you take the square, you get back the matrix of inner products. This also goes in the other direction. If you take any 3 by 3 positive semi-definite matrix with ones on the diagonal, you can decompose it as some matrix times its transpose and read off the unit vectors x, y, and z from this matrix. What this means geometrically is that if you take any configuration of three unit vectors x, y, and z and you consider their inner products, you get a point u, v, w whose coordinates make this matrix positive semi-definite. And conversely, for every point that makes this matrix positive semi-definite, there exists three unit vectors whose inner products are given by the coordinates of that point. So from now on, instead of talking about vectors x, y, and z, we can simply talk about triplets u, v, and w that make this matrix positive semi-definite. And we know exactly what the set of those points look like. We even gave it a name, the elliptope. Now it's time for the second step. Recall the original question, where we had three unit vectors with the same dot product that we called alpha, meaning we are on this line u equal alpha, v equal alpha, w equal alpha, and we want to minimize alpha, meaning that we want to go down this line as much as possible while staying inside the elliptope. And just like magic, you can read from this plot that the minimizer is the point minus one half, minus one half, minus one half. So the minimum alpha is minus one half. And if you want to find the configuration of vectors x, y, z, where the inner product between any pair of vectors is equal to minus one half, you can call the matrix square root function, which leads to the following configuration. And here I can already hear some of you scream that this is not completely rigorous, and you are right. First of all, you can hardly consider a plot like this one to be a mathematical proof. Also, you cannot really plot things in dimension larger than three. One thing you can do though, in order to rigorously find the smallest alpha that makes this matrix positive semi-definite, is to compute the eigenvalues of this matrix, which are one minus alpha and one plus two alpha. So to keep positivity, we need alpha to be between minus one half and one and therefore the optimal alpha is minus one half. This method works fine here, but in general, it's not really practical to compute eigenvalues of matrices of bigger sizes, especially if some of the entries are unknown. 
What we need is a more general solution technique that allows us to take a symmetric matrix with some unknown entries and allows us to minimize one of those entries while keeping the matrix positive semi-definite. A lot of brilliant minds in mathematics have thought about this exact problem and developed a solution for it that is known now as semi-definite programming. Semi-definite programming is often described as the most exciting development in mathematical programming in the 90s. Nowadays, there is a huge number of efficient solvers and off-the-shelf libraries that you can use for this problem. Here is how you do it in Python, for example, using the popular package CVXPy. First, declare an unknown variable alpha and construct the matrix that you want to make positive semi-definite, and let's call it A. Then, tell CVXPy that we want to minimize alpha while keeping the matrix A positive semi-definite. And finally, and most importantly, call the solve method to get the optimal solution. And here is the kicker. In semi-definite programming, you are not restricted to single entries as your objective function. You can minimize any linear function of these entries you want. You can also have multiple constraints that are either scalar equalities, scalar inequalities, or matrix inequalities. These capabilities will be extremely useful in the applications that we are going to see in the next video. But we can get some appreciation for them right now by looking at a variant of our toy geometry problem. For example, let's say we want to find three unit vectors x, y, and z whose sum of inner products is larger than 2, such that the inner product between, say, x and y is minimal. Good luck solving this problem by hand. But if you know about some indefinite programming, you can easily adapt the code we saw before to specify the right objective function and the right constraints and call the solve method. One thing that we have not talked about so far is how solvers work internally. That's a topic for another day. One pointer I can give you right now is that semi-definite programming is a special case of convex programming. And if you're interested in the topic, check out my video series on convex optimization. That's it for today. I hope you got some appreciation for what semi-definite programming is capable of. In the next and probably final video of this series, we will see two of the best applications of semi-definite programming. One application to dynamical systems and another one to combinatorics. As usual, if you like the video, make sure to like and subscribe and see you next time.